um, prepared up pretty well, set it up in two different um, two different phases. One is to um, a colleague of mine, a guy called Mike Schellever, who works for us over in Munich, we're a German Munich-based company. Uh, he's a PhD from Loughborough University. He moved, he literally left the university and went to EOS in the very early days, which is around about 1990. So his history in, in the industry is another uh, number of years on top of me. And he prepared, um, based upon patterns, a history of 3D printing, which is the basis of the information here. The second part that I have is to give you some examples of not so much the history but the, the facts of where we are now and they're primarily based around two particular videos. One that's on iPlayer at the moment which is a medical uh, application at Charing Cross Hospital with Imperial College which is really good. It has one hour left on iPlayer and it disappears so we've got to make it quick. Um, and the second one is GE Aviation which is the world's biggest uh, aerospace manufacturer, and they have a particular video on YouTube. So rather than me sell it, I just wanted to show those two videos and then maybe talk about the applications. But in my opinion, those are the height of the use of 3D printing technology. So we sit very much, or well, I put it for schedule ever, we sit very much on the high end. So really, in, in most cases, I can only talk about the high end performing um, 3D printing or as we call it additive manufacturing technologies. I'm not, I, there is some information here on, on the low end printers but my knowledge there is extremely limited so it's really just to show that through. So first question is, anybody any idea when the first patent came out for 3D printing? There's a lot of story, I mean one thing that's happened over the recent years is the hype that's gone on it and, and so the, the hype tends to have a story behind it. But are we talking 80s, 90s? When, what do you reckon? It is the 70s. Which country would you say applied for the first patent? Not a lot of people know it. <laughs> it was France. So the first patent that has any relevance to 3D printing uh, personally, I think I'm sure Da Vinci has something on his wall somewhere about it, but uh, we haven't found that yet. But effectively, the first pattern that has any relevance to what would now be called 3D printing was a French gentleman back in 1971. The technology he talked about can probably trace back to what's now called laser cladding, which is a, um, a powder, a metal powder-based process where you blast powder into a laser beam or you do a wire feed into a laser beam and then you build things a bit like FDM but using a, a powder blowing system. But this has that, uh, is the origins of that particular period. When we talk about the public opinion of 3D printing, it all comes to 3D systems, our biggest, or what was our biggest competitor, and a guy called Chuck Hall, and you're talking there into the sort of mid 80s. So generally, the perceived uh, start of 3D printing is around that time. And it's true, and it shows on here, that um, there is an element of that, but it's more a case of collecting pre-patterns, including this one, and then bringing them together into a commercialized solution. So it's slightly different to what um, the perceived history is. This gentleman, Ross Householder, 1979 in the USA, came out with a patent for basically what you're seeing there is a powder bed system. So it's, again, a lot earlier than people actually give it credit for. This was effectively then sold to, um, or, or transferred over to a guy, called, uh, a guy called Decker in the US, who um, then converted this really to SLS technology, selective laser sintering. So it produced the basis of his background. This is the convention. Chuck Hall, 3D Systems, founder of 3D Systems, with the SLA technology, stereolithography. Is that something you're aware of? Which is a resin-based technology. So you have a bath of resin, with um, and, and you stabilize that resin. <coughs> what you do is you draw a laser over the, the surface of the resin, thereby curing or semi-curing that resin. What you end up with, uh, and you repeat the process in the normal layer-by-layer -layer process. This is actually the most prolific um, 3D printing process 
originally called rapid prototyping. When I started in this industry, I actually started in 1994 with um, a paper laminating process, which I'll, I'll show you in a moment, um, from a company called Kira in Japan. Um, everybody believed that this was actually the origins of the whole technology, and it's still, if you look in public, in, in popular text, this is the origins of absolutely everything. The interesting thing with these patterns is that they were much broader than the earlier patterns. The earlier patterns were very much about parts of the technology, where this actually patented um, a, a process that could be applied to many things. So what you're seeing here is what's known as stereolithography, SLA technology, the resin-based technology, but the way it was written, it also covers the basics of selective laser syndrome as well. And um, there were some interesting things, I think maybe it might have been on the previous slide. Yeah, I like this one. So if you think of 1979, three-dimensional articles in layers and which process may be controlled by modern technology such as computers. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's, you know, it was a case of maybe controlled because at that time the abilities of computers, you can imagine what the uh, capabilities were like at that period. So Chuck Hall, 3D Systems, uh, in, in our world, one of the biggest companies out there. Um, he's the one that's given credit to it, and there's no doubt that on a global scale. This technology very much dominated what was called rapid prototyping, which is still probably the biggest use of 3D printing technology. So when you look out there, um, every single car company, people who make vacuum cleaners. There's one interesting thing, we make a, a plastics machine that we, we, we launched in 1994 and it has a build chamber of 350 by 350 and a Z height of 620 millimetres. And it's specific because it's 620 millimetres because that is the size of the panel on a washing machine. 600 millimetres wide, that's what, in your, all your kitchens is 600 millimetres. So the machine was specifically designed to accommodate that because at that time, that was where the technology was being driven as, as a reason for using the technology to make prototypes for all the iterations of things like washing machines, dishwashers, everything along those lines. So the origins of it are very clear and where they were, where they were used. In truth, most people believed in the, in the uh, early days of rapid prototyping that it would only stay in rapid prototyping. The thought of 20 years ago that you would use this method of manufacturing for production was very few people believed it. And I would actually say that that's probably the case into the mid-2000s, in truth. Mid to early 2000s, it was still believed that it would generally only exist for something to make as a look and see, as a means of checking it out. The thought of it being into production was, was very unlikely. Big point of um, Chuck Hall's patent here is, is the, the full scope of what he predicted, rather than, it, as I said before, it being elements of components or parts of process. He actually presented a complete supply chain or a complete process, CAD generation of your parts, to be able to then interface that through to pass it by internet through to your, your machine, um, interface with the computer, then control the vectors, so slice the data, convert it through, and then actually through computer control and laser control to actually then three-dimensionally produce an object. So that's why he gets the claim uh, for it, and, and valid so, because he was the first one who presented it in a full rounded package. And in our field, everything we have is SLS, so I brought some extra bits in here, but everything, not the pen, but everything else here, from spinal plates to aero engine housings, through knee joints, Volvo car parts, they're all evolutions of what we call SLS process, which is powder based, so thin metal powder or plastic powder, or sand powder, where we then um, 2D draw three-dimensional, 2D draw a layer of a three-dimensional object and uh, turn it into fully melted, fully solid part. Why this one's so important is Carl Deckard, who is um, the guy who really is known for um, um, turning this into a commercial solution. So that was into the early, into the mid-80s. 
Uh, he was uh, working at University of Texas, and then he established a company that was called DTM, a very high reputation company based in the States. DTM, in the late 90s, early 2000s, was then sold and bought by 3D Systems. So 3D Systems then became the, the holder of, of two of the major technologies. If there's any questions, just stop me and... So what was the first major technology that 3D Systems... Stereolithography. Right, yes. Yeah, so and then SLS. Yes. They, well, at this point, this was independent. So DTM competed as a separate entity to 3D Systems. Right. So DTM being powder-based technologies, uh, 3D Systems being resin-based technologies. So the resin-based technologies were amazing in the sense that the detail definition, even in the early 80s, was fantastic. You could have clear materials, but they were UV-cured resins. So when they came out of the machine, they were relatively soft. Mm -hmm. You then had to put them into a UV curing oven and turn them solid. The other downside was that um, the early materials were carcinogenic as well. So handling of them was extremely unpleasant. Um, I'm glad to say that that moved on a long time. From an EOS perspective, um, we actually started out with sterilithography in the early 90s. So EOS started in 1989, we've just had our 25th anniversary. And we started because BMW cars went to 3D systems with a specification for a machine and 3D systems did the sort of classic Ford, you can have anything as long as it's black, which didn't meet what BMW wanted. So the owner of EOS, Dr. Hans Langer, who's still the, the owner, um, proposed to build a different machine, a bigger machine. And with the backing of BMW cars, EOS was started up. That was back in 1989 with the first delivery of the machine in uh, 1991. But simultaneous to that, into the early 90s, we very much moved into this powder-based technologies. In 1994, you'll see here, we, um, we, did the, we followed through with this. Um, we, we did some tie-ups um, on, on licensing of patents for these guys, um, and we then very much moved on to the metal-based processes, which is probably one of the strongest areas in the high-end 3D printing world. This one's a diversion. I have got a little bit of a chart showing the different technologies, but this is a slightly different one. And um, the reason why I'm interested in this was because Kira, who I worked for, actually copied this process. So Kira, being a Japanese company, were contracted by University of Tokyo <coughs> to develop a commercial machine to follow through these processes. These literally, what you end up with here is um, paper that is glued, so transferred over. So on, on this process, it was a reel of paper with a sticky backing on it. And what happened was that you rolled the paper over onto a hotbed. You then had a, a pressure plate that stuck, pushed down onto the, um, onto the paper, semi so you heated it up so that the glue bonded to the layer below it. And then in this particular case, what you had was a laser that then cut a shape onto the, pa onto the paper pad. Um, it did two shapes. One was the physical shape of the part that you wanted. And secondly, what it did do was a cross hatch. Because when you finish building this process repeated time and time again, you ended up with what effectively was a solid block of wood. Or the effectiveness of a solid block of wood. And then what you have to do is spend about three days breaking it apart to get your physical part out. Um, these machines in the very early days had um, the reputation of burning holes into the cabinets of machines. The lasers were, um, it was a little bit Heath Robinson in the way it constructed up. The interesting thing is that this technology at this level, both with the Kira and also what was uh, a company called Helesis, another American company, almost disappeared off the face of the earth. Until MCOR, which is in the bottom end now based in Ireland, have really picked it up and now turned it into a low-cost production process. The nice thing with this, this was much better as a technology for producing things like prototype laptops because mm. it produced extremely good flat components where all of the other printing technologies, when you because it's a thermal process, you ended up with flat surfaces were all twisted and out of shape. So this was, had a very niche area. The other thing it was very good at was shoe lasts, molds, shoes. 
because it, again it was like a piece of wood when you took it out of the machine and finally what it was quite good at was actually forecasting technology so you could put it in use it as a, as a form of a mold and then um, effectively you could either burn it out or you could then remove those uh, out of the sun molds. So, uh, but it's interesting that this was a technology that came and went, so back in 1987, I would say it pretty well disappeared off the face of the earth at the, uh, the early 2000s until MCOR over in Ireland brought it back onto the market probably about five years ago I think it was, and now it's proven to be quite a successful low-end technology process. So just to check something, the laser, the lasers involved in this technology are only for a cutting out shape. The addition of new layers is just a thermal correct heating plant process. Absolutely. So all you ended up here was just literally cutting a shape there so that when you broke the part away that you've got a clear edge definition. And hence why you did the crisscross because you tended to break blocks off. Um, so that you end. So again, you would struggle to make very delicate parts. I remember being over in, um, in Kira, in, near Nagoya and uh, watching them do this and, and it was very selective in what you did but the parts that came out were actually very very good they were like wood which was quite interesting i was keen to look at where things come from and the message i had in, in japan relative to this was the reason why kira and the university of tokyo took this on board was that it was very common in japanese schools being a very hilly country that part, uh, school children would um, have a simple process where they would have a wooden board I don't know if it's the same in China at all, with two pegs in and paper with holes in. And what they would do is that they would cut the shape and layer on top of each other to produce the structure of the mountains that they had around. And that was the origins, or the, the thinking technology in terms of where the Japanese version of this process came on. And that, I believe, went back quite a long time. So... Uh, the idea's been around for some time. I think we just needed computers to make it really work. A little bit more efficient than scissors. Uh, this one's a slight variation because this was probably the first one that really applied anything in the metal technology back in 1988. So again, still quite some time ago. And this turned into a company called Aeromet, which used, I don't know a lot about it, but effectively it's a metal process that's using a power source um, in this case, CO2 laser, and uh, it's then using that to produce a three-dimensional dim object. The big thing with the, the metals technology was that um, it took really until the mid-2000s to have an energy source that was good enough to actually produce parts. So CO2 lasers, we launched our first metals machine in 1994 with a 200-watt CO2 laser from Sinrad in America. And in truth, we couldn't do full melt materials. We did what we call liquid phase sintering, which is a mixture of nickel and bronze. So you end up with a high melt, low melt, effectively a semi-bonding process that joins the two materials together. In fact, it's <coughs> this gentleman, Oli Nurla, who works for EOS. He's based out of Turku in Finland. So it's a joint venture activity between EOS and uh, Electrolux, Electrolux Research Development based in Finland. And he developed um, a process whereby we had a very low shrinkage material, which we call direct metal 20, which is this liquid phase, nickel bronze based material, with a shrinkage rate typically in 0.1%, which is one of the key things behind it. But even so, although the principle of making metal parts by layer, by layer as a concept existed there, in the same way that the processes in the early days of computer were restricted by uh, by the computers, in this case, we were restricted by the energy sources. And it took until the mid-2000s for the introduction of the Eterbium fiber lasers, which are now...